We all know at least one person that will believe anything they're told without question. No matter how hard you try to convince them of the truth, they just refuse to see reason and will blindly argue for insane bull****. Like, the earth being flat, the Holy Roman Empire being Roman, socialism working, or Steinsgate being good. There's just nothing more annoying than dealing with someone that has drank the Kool-Aid. Especially now that there is more misinformation and propaganda floating around than ever before. After all, we've seen how much the masses have loved lining up for the current thing over the last few years. So today, let's take a look at what happens when a charismatic lunatic really gets into people's heads. Let's see just how much insane shit that people are capable of believing and doing just because an authority figure with the right amount of clout said so. Let's see what happens when you drink the Kool-Aid. Reverend Jim Jones. The father of Jonestown. Please leave a like and a comment on this video because it really helps me in the algorithm. <coughs> but before we get started, it is in fact your boy, Raid Shadow Legends. Raid has taken gaming by storm and has brought a true console level experience to gaming on the move. With millions of champion combinations and countless tactics to master, you will conquer raids, dungeons, campaign battles and bosses, and my personal favourite mode, the PvP arena, to mine that precious salt. Raid is increasing its roster of awesome looking champions with a brand new mythical rarity, a level up from legendary champions. These champions have a special new mechanic called Metamorph that allows them to change between two different forms. Mythical champions are basically two champions in one. They can change between forms and they emerge from their metamorphosis with new skills and a new look. You can summon these awesome mythical champions from brand new red primal shards in the portal. A mythical champion's two forms both use these same artifacts, accessories, masteries and blessings, so be careful when you're choosing how to use them. These mythical champions are the most versatile champions ever seen in Raid, and you can tailor your playstyle even further and create synergies across both forms. So use my link in the description down below to download Raid for free on your phone or PC. For new players, you can get your hands on Stag Knight, one of the best epic champions around, as well as a skin for Stag Knight designed by Jontron. Just use the promo code JTSKIN before October the 7th, it's as easy as that. And don't worry, if you're not a new player, you can still get Stag Knight and the skin through an in-game event. Raid is also giving away a free legendary champion, so check out Sun Wukong, Raid's take on the Monkey King from Chinese mythology. He made his grand appearance in the game, and it couldn't be easier to get him. Just log in on seven different days between now and October the 23rd to get your hands on him. No demons to slay or journeys to the west to undertake here, just log in and get this awesome legendary champion for free. So, if you want a starting boost in Raid Shadow Legends, hit the link down below or scan the QR code on the screen to get 200,000 silver, an XP booster, 4 energy refills, an epic skill tome, and the powerful champion Drake so that you can summon a great champion as soon as you get into the game. James Warren Jones was born on the 13th of May 1931 in rural Indiana. His childhood was nothing to write home about because he grew up poor during the Great Depression, which wasn't helped by the fact that his father was crippled and living on disability after a mustard gas attack during World War I. Therefore, Jim's mother Lynetta ended up working all the time and was very neglectful of her son. Lynetta also wasn't a fan of organised religion, much to the chagrin of her neighbours. But she did believe in spirits, which seemed to have an impact on young Jim. But this doesn't mean that he was left without a religious upbringing. A neighbour regularly took young Jim to church, but apart from that, he was pretty much on his own. 
He often wandered around naked with an entourage of local cats and dogs that he had befriended along the way, and he also took home beggars and fought bullies. Jim basically spent his whole childhood in goblin mode, or at least that's how he recalled it. His childhood friends, however, had a very different recollection of Jim's behaviour that would raise a few eyebrows. Allegedly, Jim had a weird fixation with death. Jim was very, very interested in the idea of death. And that led to him experimenting on and holding funerals for the animals that he took in. And, as one of his friends put it, and I quote, When Hitler committed suicide in April of 1945, thwarting the enemies who sought to capture and humiliate him, Jimmy was impressed. In the business, we call this foreshadowing. Speaking of Hitler, uh, Jim's, Jim's worldview was very highly influenced by World War II. You see, Jim Jones was a lifelong communist, and like the vast majority of commies, he was convinced in an extremely stupid way, like most teenage outcasts with far too much free time in their hands. Jim really admired the defence of Stalingrad, which isn't a problem in and of itself, because, you know, commie or not, you can't deny that the defence of Stalingrad was very, very impressive. So, say what you will about the Soviets, it was pretty badass. However, after the war ended, Jim was very disturbed by the way that the West immediately turned on their ally, not seeming to realise that there was a very, very good reason for doing that. Jim's sympathies firmly laid on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. After getting a little bit of a taster through his neighbour, Jones got really into religion as he entered adulthood. He spent a lot of time trying out all of the local churches in his area, but he never really gelled with any of them, with his disillusionment with them all partly stemming from the fact that they were all racially segregated. Having grown up on the margins himself, Jones was very sympathetic to the plight of both poor and black people, which further fueled his passion for socialism and civil rights. But despite being unable to find a denomination that he was particularly happy with, Jones began to embark on his religious journey by himself, by preaching on the streets, which he seemed to have a real aptitude for. According to his high school girlfriend, Jones first displayed his prowess as an orator during a prep rally before a basketball game, saying, and I quote, Jimmy decided to stage an elaborate funeral for the other school. He got up and started preaching and did an incredible job. He had the control and the inflection. It was just like the real thing, but it was all intended to be a joke. He was very self-assured on stage. He had that coal black hair and piercing eyes that would look right through you. After leaving high school, Jones took an interest in medicine because for some fucking reason, cult leaders just seemed to be really into that shit. And it was through this interest that he met a nursing student named Marceline May Baldwin while he was working as an orderly before marrying her on the 12th of June 1949. But a medical career was not on the cards for Jim Jones, who had a higher calling. Jones worked in small churches around Indianapolis, including a stint as a student pastor in the Methodist Church in 1952. In 1954, Jones opened the Community Unity Church in Indianapolis, where he preached racial equality. The fact that Jones's church was integrated was a bit of a novelty in the Midwest at the time, especially in Indianapolis, which was very segregated. To raise money for the church's activities, which included working with the homeless, Jones went door-to-door -door selling pet monkeys. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea why he thought that monkeys of all things would be the ideal product to fundraise for a church but hey laugh at the goofy shit while you still can this video is going to get 
pretty fucking traumatic. But with his own church now established, Jones had a free platform to preach whatever he wanted. So of course, he immediately started spreading communist nonsense, which he decided to justify by citing Acts 435, which reads, Distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. I don't think that's what the Lord meant, but go off, King. As I mentioned earlier, Jones was very disillusioned by mainstream Christian denominations because of their segregated congregations. So, there wasn't really much guidance available for Jones until he started to travel further afield. During his trips to Philadelphia, he was heavily inspired by Father Divine's peace mission. Father Divine, whose real name was George Baker, was a very charismatic man, whose sermons were always very flamboyant, both on his part and that of his flock, who would constantly be up and down on their knees or fainting whenever feeling the Holy Spirit got too much to handle. You all know the black church stereotype. It was basically that. However, black church is a lot more fun than white church. However, Father Divine took this eccentricity a bit further. He also got his congregation to call him and his wife father and mother, respectively. He claimed to have magic powers, and he claimed to be God himself. Can American preachers, you know, just tone down the heresy for like five fucking minutes? But anyway, Divine also knew a controversial black separatist leader named Marcus Garvey, and he preached many of his talking points, which included advocating for pooling resources and redistributive cooperative enterprises to empower his congregation, who worked towards this for little to no pay. And let me tell you, Jones was very, very inspired by Father Divine. Over time, Jones's sermons got increasingly theatrical as he adopted many of Divine's affectations. Eventually, he would just straight up plagiarise the man's playbook. A decade later, Jones tried to take over the peace mission after Father Divine died, but he was rebuffed by Divine's widow, Mother Divine. But we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. On the 4th of April 1955, Jones set up a Pentecostal church called the Wings of Deliverance. And a year later, this church was renamed to the People's Temple. As Jones was uncommitted to any one denomination while being very ideologically captured, the doctrine of the People's Temple was a weird blend of Pentecostal and Methodist Christianity, New Age Huey, social justice nonsense with a weird amount of jive, I'll explain later, thrown in for good measure, so Jones was basically a 21st century Anglican. In addition to filling the donation boxes every week, the People's Temple made a lot of money through care homes that were run by Marceline. This income funded the free restaurant, which served its customers exactly as the name suggests. I wonder if the People's Temple members would have gotten upset that because of how the free restaurant was funded, it's essentially the result of the fruits of free enterprise rather than an actual example of socialism working. But anyway, Jones was involved in many social programs through the People's Temple and he used his platform to push for desegregation, provide food, clothing and housing to the poor, and to run an employment service to help black people get into entry-level positions. But it wasn't just God's house that was diverse, but Jones's as well. Jones and Marceline had adopted a part native child, three Korean kids, and a white son. And their family became particularly notable in 1961 when Jones and Marceline became the first white couple to adopt a black baby in Indiana, whom they named James Warren Jones Jr., starting a long trend among Hollywood celebrities. Also, to prove that the adoptions weren't just because he was shooting blanks, Jones did have a biological child named Stephen Gandhi. Fucking hippies. Uh, Jones described his brood as a rainbow family, saying that, and I quote, integration is a more personal thing with me now, it's a question of my son's future. Say what you will about his rhetoric so far, but at least the man was actually committed to his ideals, you know, unlike a lot of 
content creators out there, Hassan. <laughs> Hassan. Hassan doesn't believe a single thing he preaches. But it's just the shame that Jim Jones got a little bit too committed to the rest of his ideals later on. In the same year that Jim Jr. joined the family, Jim Jones was also serving as the chairman of the Indianapolis Human Rights Commission, wherein he desegregated a number of businesses, including cinemas, restaurants, hospitals, the phone company, and the police department. But while he was making progress on the civil rights front, Jones got rather blackpilled about the future of race relations in Indiana in 1962. And he became very, very worried about the prospect of nuclear war after having a prophetic vision. So with nuclear Armageddon on the horizon, Jones fretted about what to do to save himself and his flock. Until he had an idea. Why don't we take the People's Temple and move it somewhere else? So Jones moved 140 members of his congregation, half of whom were black, from Indiana to Redwood Valley in Northern California. He chose this destination because he had heard that this area was the least likely place in America to be remade in Todd Howard's image if someone were to hit the big red button. According to an article in the January 1962 issue of Esquire titled Nine Places to Hide. As he settled in California, Jones acquired properties to put up his followers in communal housing. He also ran nine elderly care facilities and six children's homes. The temple also ran a food truck and they sold wine from their own vineyards. You know, for a man of God, uh, Jones really was making an awful lot of money. With the change in scenery also came a change in the demographic makeup of the People's Temple. As you all know, California is a bit more, shall we say, cosmopolitan than the rural Midwest. So it wasn't long before the People's Temple's fundraising endeavours began to attract more educated white members. Now, Jones's appeal to poor black people was obvious, you know, civil rights movement and all that. But what attracted the middle class whites was Jones's positive positions on communism and the anti-war movement and his leftist critique of American culture, greed and materialism. As one member put it in a letter, there is the largest group of people I have ever seen who are concerned about the world and are fighting for truth and justice for the world. And all the people have come from such different backgrounds, every colour, every age, every income group. Do you see the problem here? No, not that one. The other problem. Uh, Jones had basically established himself as the sort of OG SJW, for lack of a better term, and he got the attention of the white hippies as a result. Even though the People's Temple was bringing in plenty of funds, Jones was a big proponent of all the members living communally to save money, to enable the pooling of resources, and also to foster community spirit. To this end, entire apartment buildings housed People's Temple members. Jones was very insistent that everyone put their money where their mouths were and actually live socialism instead of just talking it, which would be a considerable driving force for the People's Temple's biggest project down the line. They called their own brand of hippie bullshit apostolic socialism. You know, because all the different Marxist movements need to arbitrarily have different names so that they can be denounced as not real communism when they inevitably fail. But hey, at least these guys were the first ones to not fucking starve to death. Now, you may have forgotten that this isn't a college campus, but a church. And to keep up appearances, Jones did make tenuous connections between his political goals by referring to a concept called... Divine Socialism. Socialism as ordained by God. As Jones explained it, and I quote, Apostolic communalism is the truest form of love, where barriers between people fall because total equality exists. Because love is socialism. That is the radical sharing of all things, great or small. And if God is love, then God is the principle of socialism. 
No offense, but it sounds like some fucking commie gobbledygook. But despite Jones's continued preaching to the members of the People's Temple, religion seemed secondary to furthering the goal of redistributing wealth. And it seemed secondary to Jones as well. In 1965, Jones finally came out and told the world everything that we already knew he believed. He said that the Bible is false, and just like every single other cult leader, he said that he is God's true prophet. He even started to claim that he was the reincarnation of Buddha and Jesus. And his head went so far up his own arse that even his concept of divine socialism really just meant him. And to give Jones credit where it was due, he was self-aware enough to take the mask off and admit that his real god was Marx, as his real goal was communism all along, and he just used his own flavour of religion to make his grift go down easier. The next flavour would be grape. Um, as, you, as you can see, uh, this is a damn good attempt, but Jones couldn't quite manage to beat Rock Terrio's Pastor to Heretic speedrun. Despite the influx of white members that would have voted for Obama for a third term if they could, the People's Temple somewhat managed to avoid being gentrified as he still maintained an 80% black membership. Though Jones kind of pandered to them in ways that only a stereotypically out-of-touch pastor could manage. He developed a habit of speaking in ebonics and getting a bit too familiar with his brothers and sisters. But don't worry, it's not racist. You see, Jones was also a minority. Surprising, I know. Jones claimed to have Cherokee ancestry on his mother's side, citing his dark hair and high cheekbones as evidence. Now, I don't think that Jim Jones really passes that physiognomy check, but I'm still convinced that he's more native than Elizabeth Warren. However, Jones's followers seem to just go along with Jones's metamorphosis because one People's Temple member said, and I quote, Jim always pointed out not only that his family, his immediate family, was interracial by adoption, but that he personally was a man who was profoundly blended of many different racial and ethnic streams. But then, increasingly, as the organisation became blacker and blacker, he began to talk about himself as a black man. First, a man of colour, and then a black man. Well, they got that wrong because you're obviously white. Turns out, transracialism has been around a lot longer than we thought. So, just to be clear, Jones was one of the pastiest men that you have ever seen with a massive Jesus complex that claimed to be part Cherokee and had a habit of presenting himself as a weird black caricature. Sounds familiar. In 1971, it was time for the People's Temple to move once again which brought Jones to San Francisco, where he purchased an abandoned synagogue as a base for his continued political subversion. What did he mean by this? But anyway, Jones also set up a temple in Los Angeles, but the main base remained in San Francisco, because LA was home to a different cult run by psychopaths with alleged superpowers that fleece their followers for every cent they have. Thanks to this expansion, the work in Redwood Valley was largely scaled up for Jones's flock and other allies. Many People's Temple members were housed, Jones donated to a number of charities like a Police Widows Fund and the NAACP, they ran programmes and provided services for the poor and homeless like rehab, a free dining hall and legal aid, and Jones worked with the mentally ill and disabled, which is obvious from the politics of his followers. But while the same work was being done on a bigger scale, Jones was also branching out. He began to donate generously to many of the local newspapers and get very friendly with the media. So much so, in fact, that whenever reporters tried to look into Jones due to the massive amount of secrecy around the People's Temple, their editors would shoo them off the trail. Now, that sounds very suspicious, but don't worry. Jones was just obviously a nice guy that loved journalists. 
The fact that he started doing this right as he became involved in the political scene is totally just a coincidence. That's right, Jones was engaging openly with his real religion, and he had ingratiated himself with a number of public figures and the media. And he found solid allies with the likes of Angela Davis, Harvey Milk, and the Black Panthers. Jones also invited guests from pan-African organisations and Marxist politicians to speak at the People's Temple, some of whom were Chilean and had just recently been deposed, which just goes to show how much they were actually worth listening to. Jones managed to position himself as quite a power broker, as his following of up to 20,000 People's Temple members gave him the power to send a considerable number of votes in his allies' direction, and mobilised thousands of activists that could not only flood ballot boxes, but also deliver flyers, carry out mailing campaigns, and fill out entire rallies. Basically, the People's Temple became a huge astroturfing machine that pretty much wrote the playbook for BLM, Extinction Rebellion, Just Stop Oil, and many, many other facets of the NGO, agitprop, controlled opposition, political activist classes that we see today. Now, I don't know about you, but none of that sounds very bible to me. But Jones maintained that he was doing exactly what he was supposed to be doing, saying, and I quote, For some unexplained reasons, I happen to be selected to be God. Oh, so so he's fucking God now. But while he was publicly riding high, Jones found himself running into some internal trouble with a few of his disciples in 1973. Eight cult members who called themselves the Eight Revolutionaries left the People's Temple in protest against the fact that new white members were climbing the ranks faster than black ones who had been with the cult a lot longer. The eight revolutionaries left behind a lengthy letter which opened with a disclaimer stating that they had nothing against Jones at all, even calling him the finest socialist and leader that the earth has ever seen. (laughs) Sometimes the jokes just write themselves. And from there, the eight revolutionaries rallied against the staff of the organisation and they named and shamed, saying, and I quote... You said that the revolutionary focal point at present is in the black people. There is no potential in the white population, according to you. Yet, where is the black leadership? Where is the black staff and black attitude? Alice Ingram and Joycey Clark, what kind of awareness do they have about socialism? No, we didn't forget Archie E. James. He's like the above two. Out of date. We'll talk about Lee Ingram later. There's no black people with any discontent for today's evilness that will listen or follow any one of them. Black people are being tapped for money, practically nothing else. John Brown doesn't know what socialism is. All he's used for is to take offerings. A more specific example that the eight revolutionaries cited read, and I quote, Jan Wilsey and Christine Lucientes came to the People's Temple at the same time. Christine is put on staff even though she shows more suicidal tendencies and runs away when confronted. Jan is at the doors every meeting doing her job. Christine flunks out of school, gives the church a bad name at SRJC Nursing School, however, she's white and makes staff. So basically, their problem was that the People's Temple had been infiltrated by a managerial subclass that had no accountability and immediately subverted the whole operation to try and remake it in their own image. I genuinely think that middle-class white women are going to be the ones to unite the world and end conflict for good. Because the fact that they ruin absolutely everything is the only thing that all of us can all agree on. The letter also included a weird tangent about what I can only describe as sort of, like, buck-breaking. Very near the start of the letter, the eight revolutionaries alleged, and I quote, Proceeding a revolutionary, as you and staff would say, does not engage in sex. Anyone with any awareness concerning socialism would give up sex. The reason for giving up sex are agreeable with us, however... Who takes the privileged liberty to abuse such a decision? Staff. 
Carolyn Layton, Sandy Ingram, Karen Layton, Grace Stone, Janet Phillips, etc., has to be fucked in order to be loyal. <laughs> Look, boys, I'm just reading the letter. Uh, Jack Beam Sr., Tim Stone, name withheld by request, Mike Prokes, etc., has to be fucked in the butt for the same reason. <laughs> who, who has to do it to them? But Jim Jones, the thought of demanding your sensitivity and dedication in such a manner is grossly sick. There are other staff that's taken advantage likewise. However, the above is sufficient. One black, potentially solid revolutionary young man by the name of Ted Ballard was seduced by the older white schizophrenic staff, Faith Kice. Ted's image is ruined in the church and no doubt in his mind, he's worthless. Now he walks the fascist streets as an outcast. I'm sorry. I don't know why I found that so funny. It's, I was I was fucked by an older white woman. My life is ruined. <laughs> oh. Poor Ted. If only the People's Temple had a BMI limit for entry, then he might have been saved. The eight revolutionaries railing against getting railed then seemed to become linked to their racial grievance as the letter went on, saying, and I quote, Why are there no black men or women with a revolutionary attitude coming into people's temple? For the past six years, all staff have concerned themselves with have been the castrating of people, calling them homosexual, sex, sex, sex. What about socialism? Why isn't it top priority? If you say it is, how does 99.5% of people's temple manage to know zero about socialism? As for all socialist activism, uh, even in the present day, not much has changed. Of course, very, very few people in the communist organisation were getting any arse. Hardly surprising. So apparently the eight revolutionaries saw the massive group of virgins on one hand, saw the small group of horny female middle managers that they hated on the other, applied the Socratic method and concluded that having sex hinders the advancement of socialism. I'm not going to lie, I do think they actually might be onto something, but since these eight revolutionaries were the true socialists, it shouldn't come as a surprise that they were very resentful people. And I must admit that their airing of grievances did become rather cruel. They said, and I quote, Grace Stone, as everyone knows, doesn't know her posterior from a hole in the ground. In order to keep her in people's temple, she's allowed a fuck, or should we say, she had to be fucked. Accidentally, she becomes pregnant, and contrary to people's temple law, she doesn't get an abortion. As can be expected, she's staff. Why wasn't name withheld by request and Harriet Randolph's, aka Harriet Sarah Tropp's, sexual deviation talked about in public? So, instead of leaving room for Jesus, the People's Temple was only happy with Marx seizing their means of production. In case that passage doesn't make it abundantly clear, sex was actually discouraged in the cult. But don't take that as a practice of religious purity, because as that last passage pointed out, any little surprise miracles were expected to be cut to pieces and vacuumed out. So, despite what anyone says, Jim Jones was not a fucking Christian. Not long after the eight revolutionaries left, Jones started floating around the idea of revolutionary suicide. Bit of an overreaction if you ask me, but Jones would bring up this idea a lot whenever he felt like he was under attack, which was also a lot. Yeah, that'll show him, you know. What does Sun Tzu know anyway? Despite having gotten the wrong idea from the FBI's letter to Martin Luther King, Jones was still thinking about the future and worrying about the United States being turned into glass. So, in 1974, a small group of about 50 settlers were sent to Guyana to clear a tract of land in the jungle that Jones had actually leased from the Guyanese government the year before. He picked Guyana because he liked its socialist government, its indigenous black leadership, and its extradition treaty with the United States. I wonder why. 
This project was to be a huge undertaking with a lot of very hard work because 1,500 acres needed to be cleared of trees, roads needed to be built and work needed to be started on the buildings. And all of this had to be carried out with supplies that the settlers either made themselves or waited weeks to have delivered from Guiana's capital of Georgetown. Despite there being lots and lots of toil involved, spirits among the settlers were very high. They were all full of hope and excited about the freedom and possibilities of the project that they were working on. They were on a mission from God, after all, imbued with a divine and noble purpose. To build a small, self-sufficient farming community, including chickens, pigs and cows. Ostensibly, this was to provide food for the hungry, which is believable enough because the People's Temple was very high profile in their efforts to feed the poor. But this was merely a smokescreen for the agricultural project's real purpose, to escape from racism and injustice, which was actually another smokescreen for the agricultural project's real purpose. But all in good time. 1975 was a very exciting time for the People's Temple, as San Francisco was having an election. Jones made full use of his manpower and resources to help George Moscone with his mayoral campaign, and Jones was appointed head of the Housing Authority in return. Jones had so much clout during this period that he even became friendly with Rosalind Carter. And a rally for her during her husband's presidential campaign saw a pretty massive turnout because most of the attendees were People's Temple members. While the People's Temple was still looking all good and respectable to the outside world, Jones continued to pursue some of his more unhinged interests. He continued to be obsessed with death despite the effects of suicide on one's soul, even saying during a sermon, and I quote, I love socialism, and I'm willing to die to bring it about. But if I did, I'd take a thousand with me. I mean, that's, that's not even a, in the business we call this foreshadowed. The man, the man has just specifically told you exactly what he's going to do. Jonesy's fixation on mass suicide suddenly became a lot less abstract when he carried out a practical demonstration. He announced to everyone that some really nice wine had just been made with grapes grown at their old HQ in Redwood Valley, and that everyone should try some. Don't mind the fact that alcohol is banned here, this shit is lovely. Naturally, everyone obediently partook in the wine, and once everyone had excitedly sampled it, Jones said, Psych, it's poisoned, we're all going to be dead in an hour. Now, many of you probably haven't been to a party before. But saying shit like this while people are trying to enjoy some drinks is usually a bit of a mood killer. A bit of a faux pas, if you will. So, how did they react to their new vintage having notes of almond? They just went, nice, and probably said some poncy bullshit about the wine being full-bodied or whatever the fuck. I don't know, wine's for wankers anyway. Unless it contains enough caffeine to kill a small child and is made by a different set of religious devotees, I'm not interested. Buckfast is involved in 40% of violent crimes in Scotland, by the way. Look it up. But going back to the wine that's literally poison, no one freaked out, got upset, panicked, asked for an antidote, or even questioned why Jones had announced that he'd just murdered them all. I guess the wine really was to die for, but I really have... No idea why he said this, because Jones hadn't actually tampered with his followers' drinks. For now. Still living, the People's Temple had a busy start to 1977. There was a protest against the eviction of poor tenants from the International Hotel, which Jones had tried to prevent using his power as the chairman of the Housing Authority. But the evictions were ordered anyway, which led to a demonstration in front of the hotel that January. For some perspective on how great Jonesy's influence was, 2,000 of the 5,000 protesters that showed up came from the People's Temple. On the Memorial Day of the same year, Jones also brought 600 of his followers to a protest at the Golden Gate Bridge. And the cause was anti-suicide. 
the the people's temple went to an anti-suicide protest. Little did they fucking know. Jones was clearly riding pretty high and had become quite a fixture of public life with his iconic cloth and aviators that I'm sure has inspired many movie villains over the years. While the cloth was merely an affectation, Jones still played up the religious angle by styling himself as the prophet. Though how far he'd come over the last few years wasn't lost on some of the people that had known him the longest. One childhood acquaintance described the change in Jones' appearance over the years. Jim, I said, I'm curious, why the change? Why the sunglasses? Why the bodyguards? Jones grinned and said, Max, when you reach the top, you've got to play the part. While Jones was obviously pretty comfortable with flexing his political power, you might be surprised to know that it didn't end there. Jones also claimed to have supernatural magic powers, like being able to tell the future and read minds, because of fucking course. Jones did a lot of faith healing during his sermons, and I'm sure that you all know how this stuff works. He just said some sweet nothings, quoted some verses, invoked the name of the Lord, and hey presto, look at what it did to this woman that totally had a spinal injury and a hip condition. I love you, Christ loves you, the people love you. Now sister, what whisper? What? What whisper? What? Judging by the way that that woman moved at the end, I don't think it was Jesus that healed her, but MC Hammer. Most notably, Jones appeared to literally pull cancerous tumours out of people's bodies. And before you get put off your lunch, this isn't going to be another torturous passage about surgery. Don't worry, the tumours were not real. They were really just chunks of rotten chicken that Jones waved around and sold the bit by using a bit of sleight of hand. But hey, at least it's not cheesecloth in a glove. Obviously, many of the people in the crowd that Jones had healed were planted there, but Jones also sold his mind-reading shtick by having People's Temple members go through bins and medicine cabinets and generally acquire personal information through pretty scummy methods. So the heresy has stacked to the point where Jones has really jumped the shark. While I've called the People's Temple a church up to this point, it's pretty obvious that it was a cult from the word go. But this is the point where Jones really started doing all of the stereotypical cult shit. While he and his friends in the press had maintained a squeaky clean image for the People's Temple on the surface, there was a pretty big shit show happening behind the scenes. Jones was isolating members, breaking up families, and putting himself in the centre of his cultist lives by demanding absolute unconditional love, reverence, and obedience. You know, the standard cult shit. This was probably best exemplified by the fact that Jones adopted his old mentor's tactic of insisting that everyone call him father, which led to the cultists falling into the habit of calling him dad. If Jones was really committed to the bit, the cult story would have ended right there. Jones had such a massive god complex that he appeared to actually end up believing his own grift and getting high on his own drama. And also amphetamines and pentobarbital, which, as you would expect, left Jones increasingly paranoid, believing that the government was after him. But, but let's be perfectly honest, he was an outspoken communist agitator with a large following and a reserve of political capital operating during the Cold War. The, the American government probably was after him. In addition to the cult's hearts and minds, Jones also made his followers give him their money and property, with one group of elderly black women giving the People's Temple $36,000 of their social security every month. Members were also made to work long, unpaid hours for Jones and raise their kids in the commune or even outright sign custody over to Jones. Kids were also encouraged to inform on their parents. Weaponising children was a very common play for Jones. 
It's a very common play for communists. Other methods of control included late night meetings after long working days, which kept the cult members tired and compliant. And anyone that slept for more than six hours at night got into trouble. Everyone was also subjected to lots of confessions, which were actually just really long struggle sessions, ritual humiliation, gaslighting, and lots and lots of beatings. Oh, and Jones would very often make passes at the women. All of the psychological warfare, informants, and corporal punishment inflicted by Jones pitted everyone against each other and got them all sharing in Jones's paranoia. So much so that one of the ways Jones kept everyone wrapped around his finger was simply by taking individual members aside and telling them that they were the only ones that Jones trusted. Jones took absolutely everything that his followers had. And I mean everything. The biggest signs of loyalty that a cult member could show was dark circles under the eyes and serious weight loss, because it meant that they had given up essential things like food and sleep just to keep working for Jim Jones. All things considered, you would think that the loyalty that Jones both inspired and demanded was rock solid by itself, but this still wasn't enough for him. Another measure that kept his followers firmly under Jones's thumb was forcing them to sign fake confessions to heinous shit like molesting their own kids so that the church had blackmail material on them, which Jones called compromises. The cult members didn't get to see the contents of the documents that they were signing because they were either blank or covered up while in front of the cult members. They were told to just sign it. In 1972, one cult member named Timothy Stone even found himself signing a statement saying that he had been unable to conceive with his wife, so he asked Jones to impregnate her, resulting in his son, John. Obviously, this story was absolutely ridiculous. John was 100% Timothy's son, but this document led to devastating consequences. Four years after this document was signed, Timothy Stone's wife Grace became disillusioned and left the cult because, as you could see from the Eight Revolutionaries letter, she was treated in a horribly degrading manner. But Jones wouldn't let her take her son John with her. Naturally, Grace immediately tried to fight to get John back and Timothy would leave the cult and join her the following year. But sadly, it was going to be a very, very uphill battle. Unfortunately, Jones had an iron grip on the boy because the affidavit that Tim and Grace signed basically voided their custody rights. And before you start asking what kind of absolute idiot would sign a document like that, well, bear in mind that this guy was an assistant district attorney. Sure, many members of the cult were dispossessed hippies with no real prospects or brain cells to rub together, but there was also a lot of members with some genuine grey matter to spare. Don't forget that all of the OG Ant Hill kids were students on their way to college. And look at what Terrio managed to talk them all into doing for him. So imagine how much charm Jones could turn on with the added advantage of being neither a dysgenic freak nor French. Hell, even smarts aside, a sense of belonging is a very, very powerful thing at the best of times. And Jones managed to take that to a whole other level by appealing to the margins in a very, very politically and racially tense period of history. While the People's Temple was operating like pretty much every single other cult at this point, it did manage to stay unique by having a rather refreshing doomsday prophecy. Instead of concocting some massive divine plan with a set date that would only lead to humiliation and further zealotry, Jones just didn't bother. Instead, he just insisted that nuclear Armageddon was definitely coming at the hands of inept governments, which is probably the only thing he's ever said that made some kind of sense. 
But for all his back scratching, palm greasing, schmoozing, wooing, wheeling and dealing, Jones couldn't keep his political machine running forever. And while no nuke would hit California, unfortunately, something big was about to blow up in his face. The San Francisco Chronicle was planning to break a damning expose about Jones that contained the accounts of many defectors that had left the People's Temple. They told all about his abusive and authoritarian practices and financial fraud. But Jones managed to block the publication. However, the reporter Marshall Kilduff decided to just team up with a journalist named Phil Tracy, go to New West magazine, which Jones didn't have in his pocket, and just give the story to them instead. So, unable to stop the powder keg from going sky high, Jones and his most loyal followers suddenly and completely vanished the day before the article was published in the magazine's August 1977 issue. So, Jones had packed up and moved to their new compound in Guyana. Because Tahiti was taken, and almost a thousand People's Temple members accompanied him or followed suit in the following months. However, as far as the cultists that followed Jones were concerned, their departure was not due to the fact that their leader had been run out of the country with a soured reputation, but simply to escape the greed, corruption and persecution of the United States. Jones wanted racial equity, so he moved his mostly black cult to the jungle. What did he mean by this? <laughs> the move was met with a, a bit of a mixed reaction among the People's Temple members that were left behind. The cult may have been massive, so in practical terms, the roughly 19,000 members who were left behind could surely run things well enough on their own. But the leader and 5% of the membership disappearing naturally caused quite a stir on a more human level. Many families had been torn apart quite literally overnight. Quite a number of people had left their spouses and many of those left behind woke up one morning to find out that their children were also gone. However, could you really blame those that left for doing so? After all, the People's Temple Agricultural Project was ready and to celebrate their new compound was named Jonestown in honour of their brave father who had led them to this promised land. And a promised land it was, because the early settlers had been very busy over the last three years, so Jones and his pilgrims were ready to arrive at a truly racially equitable socialist utopia in the heart of the Guiana jungle, which was flush with crops and complete with all of the comforts and amenities you could ask for. Schools, libraries, security, sanitation, water, electricity, and food. And to top it all off, there were no mosquitoes or snakes, the temperatures were always lovely, and the intrepid pilgrims were finally free from the meddling of those pesky governments and journalists. It always annoys me when the worst people start to live my dream. So what had the settlers done with the place? Jonestown was basically a second Eden, so it must have been beautiful, a true paradise. There would be no place better to sit in a circle and read theory and sing Kumbaya. Marx's vision had been made manifest by Jones and his followers, and everyone was surely so excited to arrive. So, what did the almost literal apotheosis of socialist ideas look like? Well, picture a communist utopia. That's exactly what Jonestown looked like. While the 50 initial settlers had indeed been very busy and done a very decent job for themselves, the place was not at all ready for an influx of a thousand people, which included 300 children and 200 elderly. Jonestown was described as an unfinished construction site because nothing was actually completed. To be fair, the communists couldn't really do much work on the foundations because their delivery of a few thousand kulak skeletons hadn't arrived yet. The newly arrived cultists had to finish building the commune themselves, and there was so much work to do that even the youngest children had to help out. But the commune's amenities weren't the only thing that proved too good to be true. 
The climate was absolutely fucked. The weather was constantly scorching and Jones had also lied about the lack of snakes and critters. So mosquitoes and diseases were rife. But while the work was hard and the conditions were shit, the cultists were still working towards something. Surely they could make the best of it, because at least they had each other. Well, no, not really. After a long day of working out in the fields and the construction sites, they couldn't even get some R&R &R with their wives. You see, there were 1,100 people living on a compound that had a capacity of just 300. So, there were not enough cabins to house everyone comfortably, and most people had to sleep outside with the mosquitoes. According to the British government, bringing 400 more people in should solve this problem. Apparently. Obviously, the massive overcrowding would have been quite a mood killer for any couples, but they never even had the opportunity to spend the nights together. The cabins were segregated by sex, so all of the couples that were allowed to stay married were separated. Jones also wreaked further havoc on family structures by arranging and dissolving marriages and then taking the kids away from their parents to become his wards. But even though there wasn't much seed being spread around the commune, the cult would have had serious trouble cultivating it anyway. Because, despite being an agricultural project, Jonestown was producing... nothing. <laughs> Nothing at all. While the cult proved to be exceptional at farming money and clout for Jones, they didn't seem to be very good at actual farming. You've all seen the pictures from the Chaz. The soil was so thin and of such dog shit quality that the farming situation was absolutely terrible. And, to make matters even worse, the cultists had to do bucket brigades to keep the plants alive during the dry season. As a result of the crops being so pathetic, food was so scarce in Jonestown that the commie jokes just fucking write themselves. In fact, there was so little food to go around that some of Jonesy's inner circle actually had to go out begging or bring back rotting food from the market. From his literal throne in the central pavilion, Jones presided over what was described as a prison camp. The days in the fields started at the crack of dawn and they were long and hard. And the punishments for questioning Jones's authority were even harsher. And, as if that wasn't bad enough, the cultists couldn't even leave because Jones had confiscated everyone's passports. Jones also isolated the cult from the outside world as much as possible, but he couldn't get off the grid entirely, because Jonestown wasn't actually fully self-sufficient due to the soil quality, and the fact that the cultists couldn't really do anything for themselves. Therefore, the cult still needed to communicate with the outside world over shortwave radios to get stuff imported. The cult members also got the opportunity to call home sometimes, but while their families must have been relieved to hear that their loved ones were ostensibly okay, eyebrows would have been raised by the fact that many of these relatives were able to hear Jones or one of his lackeys feeding their loved one lines from a script. And, for good measure, all of the cultists' letters home were censored. While Jonestown couldn't quite get off the grid, there wasn't a word that came in or left that might as well have come out of Jonesy's own mouth. Jonesy's word was truly gospel in Jonestown. After all, with so little contact with the outside world, the cultists had no reason not to believe all of the wild nonsense that he was telling them. As far as the cultists believed, shit was getting real back in the United States, and it seemed like the cultists had escaped just in time because the KKK was marching through the cities, black people and political dissidents were being put in camps, and the big red button was this close to being pressed. Obviously, that's mostly nonsense, but a concentration camp for black people and political dissidents did actually exist. It was just in Guyana. In a bid to keep them staying put, Jones had clamped down on the cultists so hard that, in addition to their passports, he even took their medication from them. 
No one was allowed to leave without Jonesy's explicit permission, which he very rarely gave. And certainly never to the children, who he kept a tight watch over. This wasn't just because he wanted to remould them in his own image, but so that even when he did allow cult members to leave for essential reasons, they couldn't take this chance to escape because doing so would mean abandoning their children. Of course, Jones couldn't enforce a lockdown of a thousand people by himself, so he had Jonestown patrolled by armed guards that he called the Red Brigade. How very original, but wait, there's more. It doesn't matter how tightly you lock up some people because there will always be at least a small handful of those that would want to make a run for freedom as soon as they got the chance. But those that were healthy, childless, unmedicated, quick, sneaky and ballsy enough to actually make a run for it out of Jonestown would get eaten by snakes and tigers in the jungle. Jones was so hellbent on demoralising his followers that he told them all that any bid for freedom would end with them getting eaten by tigers. For the record, Guyana does not have tigers. Tigers are from the other side of the planet. But even if they had the spirit and the will, very few cultists would have had the strength to actually escape. Common punishments for not towing the line were regular severe beatings, locking troublemakers in coffin-sized cells, or dropping them in dry wells for a whole night, as well as withholding food from them. Not that the cultists got much more than rice and beans in the first place. But hey, at least Jones was generous enough to give them all an egg and a cookie on Sundays. Between the long hours, lack of sleep and lack of food, many cult members found themselves completely indifferent as to whether they lived or died during a certain type of drill that we will discuss later. And those that cared little enough about their own survival to care about the tigers and escaped the compound anyway were treated like traitors by Jones and referred to as fair game. But unbeknownst to the suffering cultists, help was on the way. Relatives of People's Temple members formed a group called the Concerned Relatives, and they lawyered up to try and get their spouses, kids, and other family members back from the cult, as well as bringing Jones to justice. They filed lawsuits and lobbied the US government to investigate Jonestown, since Guyanese authorities didn't really give a shit. The concerned relatives' most high-profile members were Tim and Grace Stone, whose custody battle with Jones over their son John essentially made the boy a poster child for the group. While the Stones ultimately never managed to get John back, they did manage to deal a blow to Jones by attracting the attention of the US authorities and getting the courts to grant custody of John back to his mother where he belonged. However, while this essentially made Jones's exile permanent as he would be charged with contempt of court if he were ever to set foot on US soil without John, this small victory came with the drawback of making it impossible for John to leave Jonestown. If the Stones wanted their son back, they had to go and get him themselves. Jones responded to the brewing legal trouble by tightening his security right up. Volunteers started threatening outsiders with fights to the death while wielding firearms and machetes. Jones also rallied the cult as a whole when, as Jones predicted, they found themselves under attack in the September of 1977. For six days, Jonestown was subjected to a siege by the cult's enemies and the situation was so dire that Jones himself was attacked by snipers. Luckily, however, the cult wasn't alone. Well, they were, but they had plenty of moral support from allies on the outside. Jonestown received messages of solidarity from Black Panthers named Huey Newton and Angela Davis, who basically said things like, keep fighting the good fight and Wakanda forever to keep everyone's spirits up. However, the siege, as I'm sure you will all be very shocked to hear, wasn't actually real. Jones made it all up and let the cult believe that they were under attack. Because, like any other cult leader worth his salt, one of the most important tools in Jones's arsenal was paranoia. 
Jones did a lot to stoke paranoia within the cult, including the aforementioned nighttime meetings to tell everyone how they were all surrounded by unnamed enemies. But the announcements weren't limited to just the night time. The cultists were subjected to fear-mongering and psyops at pretty much every moment of the day. Jones had a PA system rigged through the whole commune so that everyone could hear his voice at all times. And no one was allowed to talk while he rambled his increasingly insane announcements. Even in the middle of the night when the exhausted cult members were trying to sleep after a 12-hour shift. At this point, it was abundantly obvious that Jonesy's drug use was melting his brain, which had made him a bigger schizo than ever. His faculties had degraded so much that the rhetorical style that had won so many people over had almost completely disappeared. As one member put it, his trademark passionate delivery gave way to blind fury and incredible rage. But I'm sure it's not actually as bad as it sounds. Jones spent so long talking over the PA system that all of the cultists actually learned how to tune him out. So they couldn't even hear his chirping anymore. Despite Jones going out of his way to scare the shit out of the cultists, he was very, very adamant that everything was totally fine. As he did so, he would even compare himself to Jesus Christ, Vladimir Lenin and Chairman Mao to show just what a great leader he was. Well, he's not entirely wrong. To maintain Jonestown's good vibes as he saw them, Jones would get everyone to inform on each other, even going as far as to use entrapment tactics. Jones would order some cultists to approach others and simply start complaining. And if the person they approached didn't denounce them strongly enough for complaining, or if they joined in with the complaining, then they would be punished. Which was a very common tactic in Soviet Russia and East Germany. One cult member even did something as innocent as tell someone that she was craving bacon. And she got told, oh don't talk that way, you'll get beat. Obviously, this was Jonesy's way of keeping the happy facade up, but it was also to stop the cult members from organising any escape attempts or coups or revolutions or uprisings because they never knew who to trust. If you turn your cultists against each other, they will be too distracted to turn on you because they are far too busy worrying about others turning on them. Kind of like how democracy works. Funnily enough, Jones himself also didn't know who to trust. At this point, he was fully convinced that the US government was hunting him down because his lawyer came to Guyana to tell him that there was a conspiracy against him. Look, to be fair, that there was a conspiracy against him. Jones fully deserved it and then some, but I can't exactly deny that there wasn't a conspiracy against him, especially with the concerned relatives acting as a thorn in his side. But the lawyer's update had made it clear that Jones had several lawsuits on his hands that needed to be dealt with. So Jones sent the lawyer right back to the States to fight on his behalf. And this was how a cult member named Terry Buford O'Shea took her chance to get out. Terry had worked as one of Jonesy's secretaries for ages and had narrowly avoided his attempt to induct her into his harem at gunpoint by telling him no while he happened to be in a good mood. Jones was so unhinged that he reminded Terry of her schizophrenic mother, so she decided to watch her behaviour towards and around him to stay in his good graces and maintain his trust. Despite Jonesy's tendency to dictate a ridiculous number of 20-page letters of absolute waffle to Terry that blackpilled her on the People's Temple even further, her patience eventually paid off when she managed to convince Jones not to hire any secretaries in the United States. Terry made the case that hiring staff from outside the cult would be very dangerous because they couldn't be trusted. So she should go and work for Jonesy's lawyer instead. And as soon as Terry got back to San Francisco, she faked a dentist appointment, packed her stuff, changed her name, fled to New York, and absolutely fucked right off. Not caring about the fact that she believed Jones would find and kill her. 
And if he or one of his goons didn't come themselves, it was believed that he would send her and other defectors letters soaked in poison. However, this might not be true because Jones was so fucking insane that it was difficult to tell which of his ramblings were true or not, but it was still something that he threatened the cultists with. Eventually, though, Terry's past with the cult did catch up with her. Except, it wasn't Jones knocking, it was the feds. To prepare for the spooks arriving and to test the loyalty of everyone under him, Jones carried out mass suicide rehearsals called White Nights on a weekly basis. He would tell everyone that Americans were being forced into concentration camps and that people were making their way through the jungle to kill and torture them at that very moment. So, it was time to drink cyanide-laced flavourade to prevent the authorities from getting the satisfaction and use their deaths as an act of protest. After the whole cult lined up and toasted to their own demise, the aftermath was surreal. As one survivor put it, Jim would just start laughing and clapping his hands, he'd tell us it was a rehearsal and say, now I can trust you, and then in the weirdest way he said, go home my darlings, sleep tight. In June of 1978, word of the conditions in Jonestown found their way back to the United States in the form of an affidavit by a cult member named Deborah Leighton Blakey. Deborah had escaped to an American embassy, made her way home, and spilled the beans about her experience to the authorities. One tidbit that Deborah shared was some of the powerful connections that Jones claimed to have. It was no secret that he considered himself the reincarnation of Lenin and Jesus, but he also claimed to have connections to the Mafia, Idi Amin, and the Soviet government. I can imagine that the Yanks must have really bristled at such an idea, because after hearing about all of this, Congressman Leo Ryan took it upon himself to get to the bottom of what was really going on in Jonestown. He was spurred into action by a desire to follow up on rumours that he had been inundated with through the grapevine, including everyone being held against their will, beatings, imprisonment, Jones using drugs such as Thorazine to keep potential troublemakers compliant, suspicious deaths and the infamous mass suicide rehearsals. All in all, the place sounded more like a slave camp than a monastery. Because it was. Uh, Ryan was also responding to the pleas of the concerned relatives and the Stones' legal battle to get their son back. Additionally, he had also been contacted by an old friend named Sammy Houston, who was unable to reach his daughter-in-law or grandchildren in the cult after the death of his son, which had come soon after his departure from the cult. I wonder what happened there. In November of 1978, Ryan arrived at Guyana with an 18-person entourage of two aides, journalists and some relatives of the cult members, including Tim and Grace Stone. Before heading to Jonestown proper, he commenced his reconnaissance mission in Georgetown, where the People's Temple had rented a house. As he made his entrance, Ryan announced himself by saying, I'm the bad guy, and asked, anyone want to talk? But, despite such an introduction, Ryan made it clear that he was keeping an open mind and that he just wanted to hear the cult members tell their stories. But, as much as he wanted to know how the cult members felt about their lot in life, Ryan needed to see where the sausage was made for himself. Not that there actually was any sausage. Ryan and a small detachment flew out to Jonestown for a look around on the 17th of November, where he arrived uninvited. Jones had actually tried to block this visit for obvious reasons, but he was ultimately pressured into letting Ryan take a look around by his lawyers and some of the other cult higher-ups, who said that they had nothing to hide. After all, they had plans in place for visitors arriving, and looking open to outsiders could only help with their optics. What followed was structured like a tour of North Korea. Jones's lieutenants had been sent out around the commune weeks ahead of time to order the cultists to rehearse answers to certain questions that might come up during the visit. For example, if someone asked a cult member what they had to eat, they were ordered to say, well, we eat lamb and steak and chicken. And if anyone asked, they did eat breakfast that morning. 
That evening, the cult basically threw a party in Ryan's honour. He and his entourage were treated to dinner and the resident rock band, the Jonestown Express, even put on a concert. And it wasn't just a hand-picked detachment that Ryan spent this time with. The entire cult got to share in the festivities. And they were even given a half day off of work and meat to eat. Every outsider's visit to Jonestown was just like this, and it was pretty much the only time that the cult members even came close to being treated like human beings. But even then, it was merely a weird facsimile of dignity because they were basically used as props to show off how great Jim Jones was. And the ruse worked. As far as Ryan was concerned, he had seen that despite things looking a bit uncivilised, most of the cult members actually wanted to be there and were genuinely happy. But despite that, Ryan decided to invite anyone who wanted to leave to join him anyway. No one spoke up, but Ryan did receive a request for a lift home in the form of a note passed to one of the reporters that read, Help us get out of Jonestown. For some fucking reason, the reporter also showed Jim Jones this note, who became very angry upon seeing it. He took the loss of any of his children very personally, and he saw it as a failure on his part that he had to fix. But he had been put on the spot. So when Ryan once again asked the crowd if anyone wanted to leave, and 16 people stepped forward... Jones had to let them go. For now. Obviously, this split ended up being less than amicable. But one account told about how it wasn't just Jones that found it contentious. There was one couple that was practically playing tug of war with their own child because one parent wanted to leave and the other didn't. A commotion then ensued while the truck made its trip to the airstrip with the first group of departing visitors and defectors. This then escalated into quite a scuffle until a cult member tried to stab Ryan. The congressman staggered, covered in blood, as cult members pulled away the assailant. However, Ryan was completely fine. Fortunately, none of the blood was actually his. The attacker had just cut his own hand while trying to stab Ryan. Of course, this attack cut the visit short and Ryan and his entourage hauled arse to the truck and headed to the Port Katuma airstrip from whence he came. Despite all that had gone down that morning, Ryan still seemed satisfied with what he had seen. After all, everyone appeared to be happy enough and some of the cultists even saved him from a crazed attacker. Sure, a few people wanted to leave, but what organisation doesn't shed members from time to time? The People's Temple still had a hell of a retention rate, so who would miss 16 members in a group of almost a thousand? Well, Jones did. Very, very much in fact. He was absolutely fucking furious that they left. As far as he was concerned, because just those 16 people defected, it was all over. Jones was convinced that he had failed the inspection and that Ryan was going to call in the authorities, despite Ryan himself having already told Jones that everything was fine. Due to the fact that Ryan was heading to the Port Kaituma airstrip with his entourage enlarged by a gaggle of defectors, a second plane needed to be chartered from Georgetown to take everyone back to the capital. Ryan was worried about the defectors being punished after the first plane left, so he insisted that everyone left together. So, the departure was delayed while a second plane made its way over to the airstrip. But, unbeknownst to the party, Jones had sent his security team after the visitors while they waited at the airstrip. Jones's goons arrived in a trailer pulled by a tractor and immediately started shooting at both the plane and everyone else on the airstrip. A cult member named Larry Layton then revealed that he was only pretending to defect by pulling a gun and joining in with the shooting, managing to wound two people before he was subdued. There is actual footage of the gunfight and the aftermath captured by two photographers, but we obviously can't show it because YouTube, even though the full thing is on YouTube. 
The attack left five people dead. Three reporters named Robert Brown, Don Harris and Greg Robinson. Not much of a loss. They were journalists. A defector named Patricia Parks and Congressman Leo Ryan were all killed. And several more were wounded. Fortunately, most of the wounded managed to survive the attack by playing dead and fleeing into the forest after the cultists left. While on the run, the survivors managed to find a bottle of rum to use as anaesthetic and to hold out until the next day, when they were found by a rescue plane and airlifted to the United States for treatment. The same couldn't be said for the people of Jonestown, however. The commune had seen a lot of fucked up shit go down over the last year or so, but this time, Jones had really gone too far. But luckily, when cults start doing real damage, they have this uncanny ability to immediately disband before they do too much damage. Jones had done a lot of fucked up stuff, but he had managed to stay under the radar. But this time... (laughs) This time... He had just murdered a sitting US congressman. He was now completely fucked. There is is no coming back from that. There was absolutely nothing that was going to fix that. Jim Jones was now fucked. Jones knew that the US authorities were going to be coming in with a fucking vengeance. So Jones looked at the situation and thought to himself, it's time to have a white night. For real this time. A very panicked Jim Jones then got everyone gathered in the main pavilion of Jonestown and announced that it was time for what he called a revolutionary act. Jones declared that there was no hope and that everyone in the commune must have one final white night but for real this time. He justified this by screeching that the US forces were on their way to torture the cult's children, saying, and I quote, When they start parachuting out of the air, they'll shoot some of our innocent babies. And then he elaborated with, If these people land here, they'll torture some of our children, they'll torture our people, they'll torture our seniors, we cannot have this. Now, that sounds like a harrowing prospect, but don't worry, Jones had a plan. There was an easy way to stop the Americans from torturing and killing children. Firstly, is don't have oil. Secondly, is all you have to do is be quicker to the punch. That's right, it's now time to drink the Kool-Aid. And even though this upcoming event spawned the expression drinking the Kool-Aid, which means to show unquestioning loyalty and obedience to someone or something that is doomed to fail, you all use Twitter, you've all talked to leftists, you know exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) I'm kidding on, some of you are alright, we won't kill all of you when the time comes. Some of you are quite funny. I plan to. I plan to keep a few of you as pets. But I do have to point out the obligatory thing that gets pointed out in all Jonestown videos and say that they did not drink Kool-Aid. They instead drank the cheap farm foods budget version Flavor-Aid. Jones was too fucking cheap to get them the real shit so he settled for some off-brand poison. Like they had practiced many, many times before, everyone was made to line up in front of the big vat of grape flavor aid, but this time it was mixed with sedatives and potassium cyanide. Reportedly, the cyanide had been obtained because Jones had gotten a jeweler's license and jewelers are able to buy potassium cyanide because it's used for cleaning gold. I can't believe I have to say this for all of you Zoomers out there, but please do not try this concoction at home. It's not lean. It's not fucking lean. In fact, everyone that drank it ended up prone. There has been speculation about whether or not the cultists actually knew what was about to happen, or if this was just another fake white night. But I think that after the events over the last few days getting darker and darker as Jones became more unhinged than ever, I think they knew it was finally go time. Like the White Knights before it, this revolutionary act was a declaration to the world of the apotheosis of Jones and his ideals. So, a record was made as the cult achieved martyrdom. The revolution may not have been televised, but Jones did record it. And this is where we come into the infamous Jonestown mass suicide audio tape. 
Now, to set everyone's expectations, we are not playing the audio. Even though, again, you can go and find it on YouTube. But the main reason we are not playing it is it's probably one of the most fucked up audio recordings that you will ever hear. It has things like parents screaming because their child has lost consciousness and they have realised that this white knight is the real deal and their child is actually dying. And then you hear Jones telling them to calm down, their child is just going to sleep. Also, you can hear lots of children crying and screaming in absolute agony as the poison starts to take effect, and then slowly but surely, one by one, you hear them all start to fall silent. It's just a truly fucked up piece of media, and if you want to listen to it, you can go and find it yourself. I kind of don't want to play an audio recording on my channel of children dying. The tape started with Jones announcing the plan and outlining his wild predictions of what would happen if they didn't all go along with it. Obviously, not everyone in the cult was fully on board with mass suicide, though the tape doesn't have as much negativity in it as you would expect. It's still absolutely fucking harrowing, but allegedly the tape was sort of live edited by Jones pausing the recording when the sounds of pain, anguish and dissent got a little bit too loud, and then resuming it when the vibe of the pavilion returned to what he wanted. He wanted to make it appear that everyone was doing this willingly, and that the consensus was unanimous. So, when you can hear the audio getting a little bit garbled between lines and speakers, that might be why. And bear in mind that, as viscerally upsetting as this tape is, the worst parts are still what Jones wanted you to hear. So, just imagine how gut-wrenching the horrors between those garbled moments must have been. However, Jones gave the cultists time to say their piece for the record, so there was some dissent that made it into the tape. One cult member named Christine Miller voiced her misgivings about the killing of children and even suggested that the cult simply defect to the USSR. But Jones just dismissed her and started waxing poetic about how hard everything had been for him and how important he was to everyone in the cult. I don't think it occurred to Jones that he was the reason why no one in Jonestown had peace. Jones also took some time to make jabs at Timothy Stone for bringing this fate upon everyone by having the audacity to fight for his son. Sadly, it later became clear that the Stone family's fight was in vain. While he and Grace were still in Georgetown, Jones had John poisoned alongside everyone else. But of course, it wasn't his doing, oh no 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 no, the death that was about to rain down upon everyone in the cult wasn't Jonesy's fault, it was the politician that his people had murdered. Jones continued his final sermon by dumping the blame for everything going to shit on Leo Ryan, for bringing the authorities down upon them even though, again, Jones himself was the one who did that. With everyone briefed on the situation, it was time to get the show on the road. The babies and children were made to go first, with the flavour aid being squirted into the backs of their throats with syringes by Jonesy's medical team. And if you are wondering how parents could possibly allow such a horrific thing to happen to their children, well... Cult. Also, they were surrounded by guards armed with crossbows and guns who made sure that everyone complied. And compliance needed to be forced because the true horror of what was starting to unfold became apparent very quickly. Despite the kids being expected to just simply drift off into a peaceful and everlasting sleep, the poisoning was not quick. The cyanide kicked in long before the Valium did. And I'm going to stop here. Right, I'm just going to stop here because this is children and I don't know how much you know about cyanide poisoning, but let's just say it's not like the movies. It's long, it's slow, and it is excruciatingly painful. So, let's just move on. The running order of the big event was by design. 
Jones made sure that the children were taken out first so that the parents would have nothing left to live for and they would be much more likely to comply when it was their turn. And even for cult members that weren't parents, watching 300 children die must have been devastating enough that one would have wanted to join the queue so that this nightmare would come to an end. As Terry put it, and I quote, that killed a lot of the people at the head before they actually took the Kool-Aid. And pretty much all of them did. Though I can't imagine the pain and anguish that those people felt for the five minutes that it took for them to die. As the cult members started to drop like flies and some of the most devout cultists expressed their gratitude to Dad on the tape, Jones kept rambling, telling the cultists not to be afraid, trying to convince them that the poison didn't hurt. I mean, if you've listened to the audio recording, you would see that that was a complete fucking lie, and proselytizing about the righteousness of what they were doing. Towards the end of the 45-minute tape, a sinister quiet gradually descended as the crowd thinned out, until Jones said his final piece and the tape ended with that fucking haunting music on the speakers, man, I don't know, right, see, see the end of the tape, right, for me, I don't know, the whole tape's fucking horrible, right, but see the very end where there's no sound, just that music coming through the speakers, there's something off about that part. I don't know what it is, I can't put my finger on it. There's something at the end of that tape. I feel like something was there at the end of that tape, right? It's hard for me to put into words, right? All I'll say is, I am not a religious man. But I think the devil was at the end of that tape. In the end, despite a career full of theatrics and self-aggrandizing affectation, Jones was too much of a coward to commit to the bit and drink the Kool-Aid himself. Instead, he opted to eat a bullet, making him the first enemy of the US government to actually kill himself. As the dust settled on the central pavilion, 909 people lay dead. While it still wasn't the highest body count of a place named after a civil rights leader, the mass poisoning was the largest non-natural disaster loss of civilian life for US citizens until 9-11. In one broad stroke, an anti-racist figure had just ruined and ended the lives of hundreds of black people, establishing the MO of BLM for decades to come. However, 85 cult members, including some of Jonesy's own sons, survived because they happened to be away from the compound during happy hour, either out on jobs or simply hanging out at the office in Georgetown. There were also survivors from the compound itself that had been lucky enough to escape into the jungle. And yes, they managed to avoid the tigers. After all of that, I really hope that none of you said that this story couldn't possibly get any worse. <laughs> because guess what? Jones had sent a radio message to People's Temple members in Georgetown and ordered everyone there, including his own sons, to kill themselves. Only one woman actually did as she was told, but sadly, she took her three kids with her by slitting their throats. With this last injection of utter misery into the worst story I've ever read, the final death toll came to 918 people, including the deaths at the airstrip and the murder-suicide in Georgetown. There are many aerial photographs of the aftermath of Jonestown, with bodies just littered all over the place, which put such a staggering number into perspective. We are going to show you the most famous picture of Jonestown, but usually when we show pictures that have bodies in them, we just slap a demonetized logo over them. So, here you go. By the way, this was just the bodies around the central pavilion. There were bodies all over Jonestown. The next day, the Guyanese authorities arrived and found that it was very, very quiet at the compound too quiet. They expected a fight with a furious Jones coming down on them with his militia. Instead, as one journalist put it, and I quote, 
all of a sudden they start to stumble and they think that maybe these revolutionaries have placed logs on the ground to trip them up. And now they're going to start shooting and ambush them. And then a couple of the soldiers look down and they can see through the fog and they start screaming because there are bodies everywhere, almost more than they can count. And they're so horrified. They had found, let's just call it, the aftermath of Jonesy's revolution. In a moment that I can't help but find darkly amusing, they also came across some parrots that were inexplicably just chilling amongst the corpses. And they also found a single survivor. A 76-year-old black woman named Hyacinth Thrash. Hyacinth had heard about what went down at the airstrip and decided to hide under her bed where she then fell asleep. Like, I know she was, like, really, really old, but how, how, how the fuck? I mean, I'm quite a heavy sleeper, but how do you sleep through a thousand people all around you all dying in agony? To be fair, though, it's absolutely for the best that she did because it saved her life. However, I wouldn't have envied Hyacinth when she woke up because her account sounds like the opening of 28 Days Later. She said, and I quote, When I got outside, it was like a ghost town. I didn't see or hear anybody. I said, oh God, they came and killed them all and I's the only one alive. Why didn't they take me too? Soon after the Guyanese authorities had made their assessment of the desolation before them, the US military went in to clean up. The Yanks took point on the recovery and cleanup operation because the People's Temple were mostly US citizens that needed to be returned home. But Guyana has a particularly hot and humid climate, so the Yanks had a hell of a job on their hands after stumbling upon almost a thousand bodies that had been lying out on the ground, outside, completely exposed to heat, rain, humidity and critters for a week. The clean-up was, to put it mildly, a very unpleasant experience. Even four decades later, many of the recovery workers were still haunted by what they saw, especially due to the sheer number of children that many just couldn't get out of their heads. Even reporters that had cut their teeth in Vietnam were beyond horrified when they got off the plane from Georgetown, which happened to be the same one that the People's Temple ambushed, still with bloodstained seatbelts and two bullet holes in the doors. And they saw the scene at Jonestown, saying that it almost defied description. Initially, the US tried to pay to have everyone buried at the compound, but the victims' families wanted their loved ones buried at home. And the Guyanese government wanted absolutely nothing to do with the almost literal mountain of corpses on their doorstep. So the task that the Americans had on their hands went from a large to a monumental logistical undertaking. They had to take on the work of loading the bodies into body bags or metal caskets and then transporting them from Jonestown to Guyana's capital of Georgetown by helicopter, where they were then returned to the United States and stored at Hangar 1301 at the Dover Air Force Base in Delaware. As harrowing as the recovery effort from Jonestown was, it was in Delaware where the real work began. The bodies were identified through fingerprint and forensic analysis, and a number of autopsies were also carried out. Processing all of the bodies was such a massive job that the staff on the base actually had to bring in extra people to help out, which included mortuary staff, admin staff, a shitload of typists because it was the 70s, and even food service staff who were set up in tents to feed them all throughout what could realistically be expected to be a two or three week job, but they were only given one week to complete it. As you can imagine, that would have been a very, very hellish week. As Patricia Edwards, a civilian who worked in logistics at the base, said at the time, The stench. I will never forget the stench. 
Despite the reinforcements, the task still proved to be too great. Over 200 bodies were too decomposed to be identified, meaning that no one would be able to claim them or bury them alongside their loved ones. To exact whatever justice they could without having Jones face up to what he had done, the feds interviewed survivors in Guyana and other People's Temple members in the United States to get an idea of what the fuck happened and why. As a result, Larry Layton, the cult member that had snuck onto the airstrip with the defectors, was extradited to the United States and sentenced to life in prison for murdering Leo Ryan. It's not enough, but I suppose it's better than nothing. I know that I talk a lot of shit about the feds, but I don't really think that someone competent could have done much better. By April 1979, 300 bodies had been claimed, but over 500 were left to rot in Hangar 1301, because the military were looking to pass the cost to transport the bodies home onto the families to the tune of $500, which many of them couldn't afford. Unfortunately, alternative arrangements couldn't be made for some time because the military couldn't find a cemetery to bury these remains. No burial site wanted to risk becoming a pilgrimage or tourist hotspot for all the wrong reasons by taking in the Jonestown victims. Which is pretty sad, but pretty understandable. I can't imagine any community wanting to be swarmed by a bunch of surviving cult members and true crime nutters. They buried Bin Laden at sea for more or less the same reason. Allegedly. Finally, half a year later, on the 25th of May 1979, the last of the bodies from Jonestown, most of whom were children, were buried at Evergreen Cemetery in Auckland. It's a real shame that they couldn't return to their families, but at least it's sort of good that they were finally laid to rest. They certainly deserved much, much better than that, but all we can do is hope that after such a long and terrible ordeal, those poor souls have finally found peace. Further closure came in 1983. On the fifth anniversary of his death, Congressman Leo Ryan was posthumously awarded the Congressional Gold Medal by Ronald Reagan. The victims of Jonestown were also honoured with a memorial in Evergreen Cemetery that was funded by a committee involving Jim Jones Jr. The memorial was dedicated at a service on the 29th of May 2011 and consists of four stone plaques with the names of all 918 people who died. Controversially, Jim Jones's name was also included, and I don't really know how to feel about that, but the decision was explained as being purely for the historical record. It was meant to be just sort of fact-based. His name is also on there with no special attention or note of his rank. It's simply one name among many others in alphabetical order. As many of you will know, the drinking of the Kool-Aid has gone down in history as one of the most infamous incidents in cult history. And drinking the Kool-Aid has now entered the public lexicon. As Julia Shears, the author of A Thousand Lives, The Untold Story of Hope, Deception and Survival at Jonestown put it, People think they willingly died, but Jones gave them no choice. They were surrounded by a row of guards with crossbows, and then behind them there was another line of guards pointing guns. Meanwhile, Jones is exhorting them to come up and drink this potion to take them to the other side. So living was never an alternative on that last night. Most people chose to die with their families, and if they didn't drink it, there were many who were injected with the poison. Some former People's Temple members try to see a silver lining outside of Jones and his influence, from the good old days from before anyone set foot in Guyana. Jonesy's adopted son, Jim Jones Jr., said that the People's Temple allowed me, as a black man, to hold my head up high. Mike Touchette, one of the early settlers that helped build Jonestown, also saw the early days rather nostalgically, saying, and I quote, My memories from 1974 until the beginning of 78 
are many and full of love, and to this day they still bring tears to my eyes. Not only the memories of building Jonestown, but the friendships and camaraderie we had before 1978 is beyond words. One member also said that the legacy of People's Temple is, and I quote, to cherish the people and remember the goodness that brought us together. All of that bullshit is of course just an absolutely massive fucking cope. I can hardly say that coming together is a particularly good thing when the very reason you were brought together was to generate political and financial clout for a tyrant and then to die so that the rotting corpses of you and hundreds of others, including children, could litter a glorified shantytown in the jungle as a monument to his ego. The survivors' comments might be some of the biggest copes I have ever read, but I can't really blame them for trying to spin something positive out of being duped into having years of their lives, their family members, their money and resources, and even their faith stolen by a fucking monster. As much as any defence of what Jones did or stood for angers me, I can understand why they would hold on to anything they could to make the trauma easier. I hope that wherever they ended up, they ultimately managed to find peace and the sort of genuine connection that Jones dangled like a carrot but never provided. Especially since that carrot was exactly how he got them. Jones's biggest and sickest weapon was the community that he fostered. Many who joined the People's Temple did so because they were in desperate situations such as homelessness and addiction, and Jones promised them unconditional love and protection. Terry O'Shea, the secretary who escaped, was hitchhiking to California at the age of only 19 because her own mother tried to strangle her with a dog chain and she just so happened to be picked up by a People's Temple bus that promised her refuge. I've already talked about how charisma and gaslighting are very powerful tools for getting people into cults, but desperation is probably just as potent. And all of this probably came about because Jones himself was just as desperate for these same things as a result of a childhood of neglect, in which he, and I quote, didn't have any love given to me, I didn't know what the hell love was. The cult existing as a sort of twisted surrogate family does make a sort of sense, but don't get me wrong, I have absolutely no sympathy for Jones whatsoever. He's one of the most evil men that has ever walked this earth, and I hope that he is burning in a circle of hell that was made just for him and Rock Terrio. The result of the Jonestown project was described as neither racial justice nor socialism, but a messianic parody of both. So, not real communism cope aside, it's interesting how Jones made politics and religion his entire identity, and in the end, the only thing that he actually believed in was himself. The problem with cults like the People's Temple and communes like Jonestown is the fact that you can't just try to rebuild Eden in your own image and pretend that the fall never happened. Man was cast out for a reason, so of course any attempt to get people to uneat the apple, if you will, will get horribly, horribly ugly. But then again, Jones was a communist, so... What apple? Like the Ant Hill Kids video before this one, I'm not entirely sure of how to wrap all of this up, because it's just so fucking grim that I'm just glad it's over. I'm sure that I've bummed all of you out enough already, so I suppose that the only thing left to do is pay tribute to Jonesy's victims and hope that they manage to find some peace in the end. So, a toast. Let's all raise a cup for Jonesy's victims. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Thank you on YouTube. Everybody subscribe.